Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I want to dedicate an episode to morphic fields. This is a very critical idea to understand in the process of reality creation. If you check out my episode, You Are a Field, I talked about this a little bit. We also heard Quo speak about this in a recent channeling on February 11th, 2023. They explained that the morphic field for both as an individual and as a group consciousness, your consciousness generates a field that you can influence the very material of your environment. This field particularly can influence those biological aspects of the second density and the third density. Quo goes on to explain that your biases, your mental imbalances are projected into this morphic field that is around you. You are a field. You are walking around in an energy field that you largely cannot see. And there are nested fields within fields and you're interacting in fields all the time. You have to get outside of the idea that you are your body. That is simply not true. You are your field. And this field is much farther and expansive than you can imagine. If you just look scientifically at the way that you spread your own DNA, breath, and energy around, it's fascinating. Scientists have found when you sit on a chair for 20 minutes and then walk away, they can still see the DNA that is in the air in that particular chair and it remains there for a long period of time. Why is it your cats love to jump up on the chair after you leave? Because you leave a remnant of light and energy wherever you go. I usually put on a cologne for my wife. She loves different colognes, so I I wear them for her. And the other day I was sitting in the backyard meditating and my wife had pulled up pretty long distance away and could get a whiff of the cologne in the air so she knew I was there which to me said that my very presence and my smell and remnants of my body had spread so far that she could smell that she has a very tuned in smell but our minds are also interacting very much like the nose can smell something at a long distance this field is a field of light that literally can manipulate the world around you so we can use these morphic fields to become more effective at creating our reality and influencing it in a variety of ways the term morphic field was first coined by british scientist dr rupert sheldrake he has published a number of scientific papers on the subject his work is fascinating if somewhat dry and not always easy to read The great thing about morphic fields, though, is that you don't need to have a detailed understanding of them in order to use them. A field is a kind of energy that can affect matter or stuff, to use the less scientific term. We're all familiar with at least one kind of field, a magnetic field. Even though we can't see it, we know a magnetic field can affect certain stuff, particularly metal. The dial on a compass moves because it is affected by the Earth's magnetic field. And those little fridge magnets work because a magnetic field holds them tightly to the metal door of your refrigerator. A morphic field also affects stuff. It's less fussy than a magnetic field though, because the stuff it affects is elementary particles. These are the smallest particles known to science. If you took anything in the universe, chopped it in half, and kept chopping the halves in half, you would eventually end up with a single molecule. If you kept going and chopped it up, you would have some atoms. And if you chopped those up, you would be left with elementary subatomic particles like electrons and quarks. These particles are what are affected by morphic fields, and because everything in the universe is built out of them. That means morphic fields affect everything. They exist everywhere. They are inside you right now and inside me and inside the sounds of my voice as they broadcast to you. They're in the air around us. They're in space. 
They are in other stars and other planets. Morphic fields are themselves part of the building blocks of the universe. Rupert Sheldrake explains that over the course of 15 years of research on plant development, I came to the conclusion that for understanding the development of plants, their morphogenesis and genes and gene products are not enough. Morphogenesis also depends on organizing fields. The same arguments apply to the development of animals. Since the 1920s, many developmental biologists have proposed that biological organization depends on fields, variously called biological fields, or developmental fields, or positional fields, or morphogenetic fields. All cells come from other cells, and all cells inherit fields of organization. Genes are part of this organization. They play an essential role. He goes on to explain that morphic fields underlie our mental activity and our perceptions and lead to a new theory of vision. As discussed in his book, The Sense of Being Stared At, the existence of these fields is experimentally testable through the sense of being stared at itself. There's already much evidence that this sense really exists. You can take part in experiments on his website and read about the results of this online staring experiment. The morphic fields of social groups connect together members of the group, even when they are many miles apart and provide channels of communication through which organisms can stay in touch at a distance. They help provide an explanation for telepathy. There's now good evidence that many species of animals are telepathic and telepathy seems to be a normal means of animal communication. Telepathy is normal, not paranormal natural not supernatural and scientifically we now know that these morphic fields of mental activity are not confined to the insides of our heads they extend far beyond our brain through intention and attention we are already familiar with the idea of fields extending beyond the material objects in which they are rooted for example magnetic fields extend beyond the surfaces of magnets the Earth's gravitational field extends far beyond the surface of the Earth. Keeping the moon in its orbit and the fields of a cell phone stretch out far beyond the phone itself. Likewise, the fields of our minds extend far beyond our brains. Sheldrake's summary is that, one, that these morphic fields are self-organizing wholes, and secondly, they have both a spatial and temporal aspect and organize spatio-temporal patterns of vibratory or rhythmic activity. Third, they attract the systems under their influence towards characteristic forms and patterns of activity whose coming into being they organize and whose integrity they maintain. The ends or goals towards which morphic fields attract the systems under their influence are called attractors. The pathways by which systems usually reach these attractors are called creodes. And fourth, they interrelate and coordinate the morphic units or holons that lie within them, which in turn are holes organized by morphic fields. Morphic fields contain other morphic fields within them in a nested hierarchy or holarchy. And five, they are structures of probability and they have organizing activity that is probabilistic. Six, they contain a built-in memory given by self-resonance within a morphic unit's own past and by morphic resonance with all similar systems. Now, I know that sounds complicated, but we can use these understandings and concepts of morphic fields to help us to enhance our ability to communicate with others and also to integrate into our creative actions. A magnetic field affects metal in that it attracts or repels it depending on the orientation of the field. What about morphic fields? Does it have properties? According to Sheldrake, morphic fields are what organize matter into complex structures. As I said before, the elementary particles that bunch together to form an atom don't just do so by accident. They are pulled together in just the right combination by morphic fields in a process called morphic resonance. The process infers that there is a form of communication between elementary particles that is enabled by the morphic field. This communication is entirely independent of distance. A particle in your hand could be communicated with a particle in your nose, just as easily 
and instantaneously as it could be conversing with the particle in the sun or a star in a distant galaxy. We understand this from spooky action at a distance, but it plays a role in these morphic fields. It is this potential for particles to communicate with other particles that make morphic fields so useful to us. If we had a way to control morphic fields, we could control any particle. And as all matter is constructed from particles, that means we would have control over all matter, wherever it might be in the universe. Clearly, we don't have that kind of control yet, but we do have some influence over these fields that is growing. We know that some morphic fields can be influenced directly by living cells and organism, which includes people like you and me. These are called morphogenetic fields, as their name suggests. They are found at the intersection of genetics and morphics. Morphogenetic fields are thought to be responsible for all kinds of organizing behavior. It is believed that they have memory, that something that happens to one particle can be recalled by all others. This may explain why some people, for example, believe that they have been reincarnated and can clearly and otherwise inexplicably correctly recall events from a past life, events of which they could not possibly have any prior knowledge by conventional means. The implications of morphogenetic fields and memory are huge. It has been said that with a large enough database of information, it would be possible to predict the future if you knew everything that had happened in the past and could access that information, collate it, and study it. You could look for patterns. History shows us that events are often cyclical. They repeat in predictable ways. Wars often follow economic crises. Revolutions eventually follow unjust dictatorships. On a more granular scale, we can predict future weather based on information about how climatic conditions have acted in the past. As more and more information about climate is gathered, and as computers become even more powerful, so weather forecasts become more and more accurate. Now consider that all human experience is bound up and stored within the morphic field. Every action taken by every individual, every thought anyone has ever had, every decision ever made. With such a gigantic base of knowledge and shared experience available, it must be possible to predict the outcomes of any given situation or event with some degree of accuracy. This is probably how divination works, or that surprising response you get in tarot. The memory of the morphic field has all the information and the processing power to come up with a likely answer to almost any question. Metaphysical arts like the tarot or numerology or even reading tea leaves are just means by which we can access this information. That's not the only property of a morphogenetic field. The fact that these fields act on and are influenced by organic matter and that we ourselves are made of organic matter mean that we can and do manipulate them. Our actions and our thoughts touch the fields. They ripple out into the universe. Everything you say, think, or do is connected to everything else. Everywhere. It's pretty mind-blowing. But physics has already proven to us that this is true. Quantum superposition, one of the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, tells us that a particle, such as an electron, exists in all theoretical states simultaneously. That means an electron exists here, there, and everywhere at the same time in its wave state. It is spinning and not spinning at the same time. I know that sounds crazy, but it means that the very particles that make up you, me, and everything else exist in you, me, and everything else at the same time. Only when particles are measured or observed do they fix themselves in one single configuration which includes a single position. That's why we appear to have fixed physical forms because we ourselves are observers. In practice, what this means is that we can use morphogenetic fields to communicate with everything and everyone. This, I believe, is what is being talked about when Jim McCarty says that the Akashic Record awakens. There is an overall morphogenetic field that is starting to become conscious and connects us all and there are nested within it 
multiple morphic fields that are around families, communities, and are almost pendulums in some cases. But we have the ability to influence these fields. You've used them. You've already experienced communication through morphic fields. It happens all the time. We send out and receive messages in our thoughts continuously. But because we aren't accustomed to using this method of communication, we rarely take notice. We don't realize we're receiving someone's thoughts. It's not surprising as these messages bypass our conscious mind unless we've specifically told it otherwise the subconscious which is quite happily processing these communications will just file them away somewhere they won't be seen it's like an efficient personal assistant screening our calls but every now and then one of those calls slips through it's as if our assistant popped out to get a sandwich or fell asleep at their desk with nobody to screen the call it gets rerouted to our main line of communication i totally suggest that you read Morphic Fields Made Simple by Michael Ambazok and Robert Mason. Very good discussion of how to use morphic fields and the way they work. Here's where you have experienced this yourself when we talk about it. Every once in a while, you'll find yourself thinking about someone. Might be someone you haven't seen in a long time or maybe someone you were thinking you need to get in touch with. Your train of thought is interrupted by a text or your phone rings, you answer and it's them. We have discussion of this all the time. It's mentioned by a ton of different New Thought teachers. And see, this isn't a coincidence. This is morphic field communication in action. The person who was about to call you sent out their intention into the morphic field. They didn't do it deliberately. It just happened because, as we know, everything is connected. At the same time, your subconscious mind for whatever reason decided to let at least part of the message through just enough that you started thinking about this person and then the phone rang the intention to text is just one example for how we pick up messages through morphic fields there are plenty of others anytime we find ourselves thinking of something especially when we don't know why we are thinking of it and then that thing comes to pass it is our mind trying to relay what it has received A very common example is having a song suddenly pop into your head and then for that song to come onto the radio shortly afterwards. Here's another example. I might be out shopping and suddenly I have a desire to get some unusual item. Something I would never get. And I might buy it and then come home and my wife was thinking about needing it. It Happens all the time. Or I might get a text after I've already purchased something and my wife says, oh yeah, I was going to tell you, you need to go buy this thing. In researching this topic, one of the most fascinating and somewhat concerning aspects of this new idea of the morphic field is a book called Marketing and the Morphic Field by Anne Bankman. In that one, Bankman documents a number of major corporations that are starting to use the morphic field in their marketing. She lays down theoretical foundations and gives copious examples of marketing strategies utilizing a morphic understanding. An example that is often cited in literature about morphic fields is from a study of monkeys during the 20th century. This story helped to stimulate interest into the subject of morphic fields. According to the story, some zoologists were studying the behaviors of a species of monkey on some islands off the coast of Southeast Asia. These monkeys dug up yams for food. The zoologists who were studying the monkeys observed how the monkeys would dig up the yams with a stick and also how mature monkeys would teach younger monkeys how to dig up yams in this manner. It is not obvious that the morphic field has anything to do with this kind of learning behavior. Zoologists found something truly amazing. On one of these islands, isolated from the other islands, a monkey learned how to wash off the yams, which was a new behavior that had never been observed before. The monkey showed the other monkeys how to wash off their yams, and soon the other monkeys on that island were demonstrating the new yam washing behavior. The zoologists observed at some point in time this knowledge of yam washing jumped 
from this one island where the behavior originated to other islands. So understanding this idea, a lot of tech companies are starting to experiment on certain technological devices like helmets and virtual reality programs and getting people to interact with these technologies before introducing them to the rest of the world. And what happens is it jumps the island. Before introducing this technology, suddenly you find yourself using it and feeling comfortable somewhat with it, even though it's never been introduced. Morphic Field Marketing is a brainchild of Dr. William Nafari, professor of marketing at the Wharton School in Philadelphia. Nafari believes that morphic field marketing strategy may eventually allow companies to gain market share for specific products against rival companies that are selling similar products. However, morphic field marketing is being used primarily to introduce radical new technologies to create entirely new markets where none existed. So I'm proposing before these companies start utilizing morphic fields in their advertising campaigns and learning about how to interact with morphic fields that we begin to control and manipulate our own morphic fields. How exactly do we move from passively interacting in a morphic field to active morphic manipulation and communication? What do we need to do to take control of the morphic fields to have them work for us? To find the answer, we need to understand how passive morphic communication works. Passive morphic communication doesn't happen all the time, as we've seen. It just seems to pop up every now and then. A lot of the time we aren't even aware of it until much later. Infrequent as it may be, it is possible to isolate the conditions present when passive communications in the morphic field occur. After a lot of research, many people started to discover that there was one thing in common when these things happened, that the sender and the receiver were in a relaxed state of mind. And this seems to be verified by research, studies, and experimentation done by Silva Mind Control and using the Silva Mind Control technique. The complexity behind the simple answer is that there are many states the mind can be in. It's not as easy as just being relaxed and not relaxed. There are a lot of different levels of relaxation, a highly granular scale. It's a bit like different channels on a radio. There might be 40 channels to choose from, and if the sender and receiver aren't both tuned in to the same one at the same time, the message won't get through. So as you can imagine, when dealing with a phenomenon that manifests infrequently, research requires a lot of patience. What they found was startling to say the least. They discovered that at the right level of relaxation, the sender can get a message through to a receiver without the receiver needing to be at the same level. It's like a special channel. So in order to understand this, we need to understand brainwave frequencies. Our brains work by sending electrical messages from one neuron to another along pathways called synapses. And our neurons are firing away all the time, sending messages around the brain, maintaining our body's thinking. We call the electrical signals caused by these neurons brain waves. It can be measured by electroencephalography, EEG, like radio waves. Brain waves have a frequency, which is to say they occur a certain number of times per second. The frequency of human brain waves is not constant. It typically fluctuates between one hertz and 20 hertz, one cycle per second to 20 cycles per second. Our brainwave frequency changes as we get older. Children's brainwaves occur at a lower frequency than those of adults, for example. It also changes during the day and night. The frequency is not the same when we are awake as when we are asleep. Broadly speaking, there are five bands of brainwave frequency, four of which we spend most of our lives operating at. These bands are delta, which is one hertz to four hertz. This is the lowest frequency our brains operate at under normal circumstances. We experience delta at least once every 24 hours when we are asleep. Not all sleep happens at this frequency, only the deepest sleep where dreams occur, where you have the rapid eye movement sleep. Babies' brains operate at delta all the time. It's possible to enter the delta state whilst awake 
Sometimes this can occur when we are particularly focused on a task, but it is also possible with practice meditation to enter delta at will. Then there's theta, which is 4 hertz to 8 hertz, and this is the level associated with lighter sleep. The upper frequencies of theta occur when we are drowsy, the moment between waking and sleep. Children, very young children, are often at the theta level. Then there's the alpha. This is the level that is discussed in civil mind control as the key level for mental telepathy as confirmed by these studies with morphic fields. A relaxed state of mind brings about the alpha level. We enter alpha numerous times through the day. When we first wake up in the morning, we come out of delta, pass through theta, and then spend some time in alpha. The reverse happens when we go to sleep. We drop into alpha as we relax, then doze off into theta. We also drop to alpha when we're daydreaming and when we are concentrating on something that doesn't require much brain processing power. Mowing the lawn, ironing, driving your car, washing are all repetitive tasks that often lower our brain frequency to alpha. Beta is where we spend most of our time. That's 13 hertz to 30 hertz. When we are active, working, thinking about something in a structured way, talking or otherwise engaging with others, our brains are in beta. Then there's the mysterious gamma, which is 30 hertz to 100 hertz. And if you follow Joe Dispenza, this is sort of a magical frequency that can come up. The brain can boost itself up to higher frequencies on demand. And this can happen when searching memory for specific information or in deep states of meditation in some cases. The frequency band is of interest in manipulating the morphic field is alpha or 8 hertz to 13 hertz. It's almost like a magic state of mind. You might think that as our brain waves slow down, we lose concentration and can think less clearly or process less information. But actually, the opposite is true. Alpha state is where our brains seem to work most efficiently. If you were to think about a car, a car might be capable of driving at 150 miles per hour, but will usually be most efficient in terms of fuel economy at around 55 miles per hour. Brains are the same. The higher frequency are, are useful for processing bursts of information. If we hear a loud noise and at the same time see something surprising, a firework, then this double sensory input will send our brain waves skyrocketing into gamma as the synapses fire off in all directions. According to Mbozik and Mason, all of our research and our testing with thousands of subjects has shown that we have the greatest power to influence morphic fields when our brain waves are in the alpha band. We've even narrowed it down to a particular frequency, 10 hertz. It seems that morphic fields themselves resonate at this frequency, or a harmonic of it. By slowing brain waves to the same frequency, those very brain waves resonate and interact directly with the morphic fields. We can actually affect them just by thinking, provided our thoughts occur at the right frequency. We can initiate active morphic communication at will. And the really amazing thing is that when we do so, the receiving person doesn't need to be tuned into alpha in order to pick up the message. The communication is so strong when we send it from alpha that it gets picked up regardless. It gets even better. When we manipulate morphic fields consciously and willingly, we can achieve more than simple communication. We can set off all sorts of reactions. After all, morphic fields are present everywhere, touching every atom in the universe. We can interact with all those atoms and actually change their behavior. There are lots of ways into reaching alpha. There's lots of studies and research that has been done. The only way you can really know is through an EEG machine. And most of us don't have an EEG machine to evaluate our brainwave frequencies. There's some headsets and cool tech that you can get. but. We've already seen how our brains are naturally at the alpha several times a day. When we are daydreaming, we are by definition not aware of the state we are in. As soon as we snap out of it, the alpha state is lost. We cannot then just use daydreaming as a method for entering and utilizing alpha because we need to be in full control of our thoughts if we wish to control and benefit from morphic fields. The other times we're naturally in alpha are just after waking up and just before falling asleep. These times can be used. Why is it we always hear from Neville Goddard and Joseph Murphy and others that that time is the sweet time? Part of it is because we are in the alpha state. 
During these periods, we are often in the borderline between alpha and theta. If we don't have self-control, it is very easy to drop too far into theta and simply fall asleep. With practice, we can overcome that problem, and these in-between times can become very productive. It still doesn't help us if we want to use morphic fields during the daytime, but it is one way for us to do it. There is a way that exists. It's been used for thousands of years by people from all over the world. It has been tried, tested, refined, and studied. It is not only useful for reaching alpha, it can also have great health benefits, and that's meditation. Beyond that, meditation doesn't always bring you into the alpha state. Silva Mind Control, through study, found that rolling the eyes up at a 45 degree angle and slowly counting down consistently brought people into the alpha state the fastest and that has been the most effective technique that I have found when I monitored my brainwave frequency with a technology called Mindwave or NeuroSky. But in meditation, we can reach that state. This is why oftentimes you'll find I spend a lot of time on relaxation techniques and exercises on my meditations because I'm trying to get you into that brainwave state where the affirmations or whatever else we're doing can hit that sweet spot and really spread into the morphic field. Now, I don't have scientific proof of it, but I can tell you from my own personal experience and being able to see energy, which I can sometimes do, not always, that when I work on my Merkaba, which you can find in the Merkaba meditations, when I work on my Merkaba, I'm able to expand my own personal morphic field and intensify the way I'm able to use my morphic field with those that are around me. That's been the most effective and most powerful that I've been able to find. Doing the Merkaba technique and just simply rolling my eyes up at a 45 degree angle, breathing slowly and counting down from five or 10. What's really amazing is I believe that this is the sweet spot for visualization. When you visualize in that alpha state, you are influencing the elementary particles that are involved and you're projecting out an energy that starts to self-organize into new and wonderful things in processes and in time. So the technique of visualizing from a state of alpha brainwave frequency is the most direct way we know how to communicate with morphic fields. We are talking to them in our own language. We're not talking to anyone else. We're actually communicating with the field itself. We're talking to it. And these fields are becoming conscious so we can start having conversations with them. We are on its wavelength. This is not enough to get them to work for us. It's the beginning. There are three requirements. The other is desire and belief. Together, with desire and belief, we can completely control the morphic field. When all three of these are present, that's the sort of triangle that's required in order to see things actually start to happen. When you integrate a desire and you have a true belief about something, when you're projecting thoughts out into the morphic field, that's when I have found it to be most effective. Research and experience has shown that the best results come when the three sides are present, when you have desire, when you have a belief, and you're in that perfect state of alpha, when all those three things are present, you have the energy and incredible things can happen. Now, I could spend a whole bunch of time in this episode talking about desire and belief. We talked about those things. But I am suggesting that you can use this morphic field, which is nested within a larger morphic field. And by continually using these alpha techniques you can do what we're talking about and you can use it to find money you can manifest money in the morphic field you can find love it's super easy for you to reach out into the morphic field and imagine finding the love that you want and the morphic field starts to self-organize and bring you the things that you want and you can find soulmates. You can use it for so many and variety of things. And I think eventually the more and more people that start to consciously interact with these fields will start to understand that this field is alive. The field that you're within 
is you and it's alive but these other fields that are nested within it are alive and you'll start to recognize them control them understand them and some amazing things can happen I believe that these elementary particles exist within multiple states and in multiple dimensions and once we start interacting with conscious morphic fields we will be able to maneuver and surf through different realities and amazing things will be able to happen so take a moment with me and begin to slow down your breath close your eyes breathe in through your nose Roll your eyes up at a 45 degree angle. While there, we're going to count down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Taking slow deep breaths you feel your body relax and your mind slows to an alpha level from this place in this space become aware of the energy field around you with your energy body reach out around your body outside of your head a few inches outside of your arms and legs and see if you can sense this field that is around you. As you become more and more tuned into this field that's around you, you can extend it through intense concentration and breath and deep meditation. You can become one with this field, stretching this field outward. seeing it expand beyond your apartment or house into the community that you live the town the city the state expanding this field outward seeing it and remaining relaxed you begin to visualize the things that you want to exist within your life projecting this visualization outward making the visualization as rich as possible understanding that you are communicating with this morphic field and sending a desire and a deep belief that you wish to experience this thing in your life while in this alpha state you can send messages to anyone and you can use this to experiment with your ability to actively communicate with others within the morphic field. Send a message to someone if you wish. Now you slowly come back to yourself, counting down from three to one. Three, two, one. You can open your eyes and very quickly in this moment we have created a connection with the morphic field around you as you continue to do this and become aware of it in your meditations you'll begin to actually see these fields you'll see the field that you're in and the larger fields that you're nested within eventually becoming aware of the morphic field of the planet itself you interact with these fields and with your brain waves tuning into its frequency you can completely influence control and help others with this connection that you have so I want you to ponder and think about this and simply move beyond the awareness that you are just your body you are a field and you are interacting within a morphic field and it seems very simple yes I could simply not do this episode and I would have you influence your morphic field but this gives you a clear understanding for many of what actually is going on you want to get yourself in a relaxed state for a reason because that's the sweet spot in which you can communicate with these morphic fields you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome 
to the Reality Revolution.